Okay, welcome inside another edition of the 360 Sports Show. I'm Andrew Pazelli, joined by Christian Lauber. Right off the bat, we'll just get to uh, uh, the, the the formalities. Um, if you haven't yet, go follow us on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, the 360 Sports Show, at 360 Sports Show. You can email the show, um, the360sportsshow at gmail.com. Uh, you can send us questions, comments, concerns, general thoughts, uh, anything pertaining to the world of sports. Um, make sure you uh, subscribe to us. You can find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, uh, a litany of uh, platforms we are available to you. And thank you to everybody who has been uh, already subscribing, liking, rating, sharing, spreading the word. Um, you know, we really, really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to jump right into the lead story of the day, uh, and that is the Kansas City Chiefs defeating the San Francisco 49ers in Super Bowl 54 by a final score of 31 to 20, the Chiefs come back in the fourth quarter to win. Um, Andy Reid finally gets a Super Bowl. Um, the Niners uh, are denied. Jimmy G is denied um, his moment to try and win his first Super Bowl, actually as a starting quarterback. Um, lots and lots and lots to digest from this. Um, so uh, I'll turn to Christian. Uh, what is your opening thoughts uh, uh, about how that game played out last night. Uh, there's a lot of levels to it, but what's your biggest takeaway to start? Man, the first half was boring. Oh, my God. Um, it was a pretty good game. Um, not exactly how I thought it would go. Both quarterbacks were pretty not great in, all the way through. Um, Mahomes came on late, but even he had a rough day there in – you know, the first three quarters. Uh, Garoppolo was trending to be the MVP probably until he, he wasn't. Um, but, man, Chiefs, again, I think, you know, they're here to stay for quite a bit of time now. Mahomes, I, he, he's the real deal. He's got some stones, and that comeback was legit. Although Shanahan, again here, he's got this thing in big games to, to crap away leads and – that's a, a another devastating loss for him and Garoppolo I thought you know he he had to prove it and he was not good in the fourth quarter I think what I'm most excited about and and take away from the game um is that all the storylines we talked about coming into the game um how will Shanahan be in a big moment can Andy Reid manage the game correctly um, you know, can the Chiefs win if Mahomes doesn't have a great game? Is Jimmy G just a passenger? All those storylines and elements, we got answers to them last night. Yep. It, it wasn't like the Chiefs won in a route and it's like, wow, like they just had an amazing game. Um, I think we really got to see both of those teams um, go toe to toe. Um, and kind of the way I thought it would play out the first half, you said snooze fest. I think it was just a struggle. I think both teams really weren't ready to start throwing. I mean, the first half looked like two teams that were scared to lose. They were playing it very conservative, yeah. very conservative. Um, and uh, the second half, obviously, things opened up uh, a bit more. But I think you've got answers to all of those major questions. Um, you know, we'll start at, at the top. Um, Pat Mahomes did not have a great game. I did not think he should have been MVP. Um, I know it all starts with him, and it starts with the quarterback, and he's the one leading the drives and making the plays. But um, I thought a guy um, like Damian Williams absolutely deserved uh, to, to be MVP. 100% agree with that. I was actually going to mention that as well. Uh, Williams, not only was he good on the ground, which I did not expect, I thought for the most part, Kansas City probably wouldn't really run the ball, and if they did, they wouldn't get much out of it. Uh, 17 carries, 104 yards, and the touchdown. And receiving, I mean, the end of the game there, he ran down the sideline for the, for the late score. But it, overall, I thought he was the best player on the field. Four reception for 29 yards and the other touchdown. Uh, he was 100% the most consistent guy they had on offense and deservingly, uh, undeservingly so. I would say Mahomes got the MVP by default for being the quarterback. But uh, in my mind, Williams was it. And although Mahomes came on late, not a good day. Yeah, not, not, no, neither he looked, quarterback. He looked, yeah. looked rattled, I'd say, for for most of that game. Like that, that second pick was just like, oh boy. I mean,. You know, this is just not his day. They they figured something out. Um, you know, the other side of that with the Chiefs is, you know, I, I think I texted this to you. Um, 
There's seven minutes to go. The the Chiefs are down ten. And this has been Andy Reid's whole career. It's what happened to him the last time he was in the Super Bowl. Patriots were up ten. It was like eight, seven minutes to go. And Andy Reid teams in the past have just not managed that team uh, that situation correctly. They've he either doesn't have timeouts to use at the end of games, or his teams are just no sense of urgency. Um, now, obviously, he this is probably this is the best collection of talent he's had to work with. Um, but I was glad to see them get aggressive because I said, "Oh, watch what's going to happen. They're going to take like which San Francisco was forcing the Niners to uh, was forcing the Chiefs to drive the ball." Um, but I said they can't be content to just take five yards, six yards, five yards, six yards here. They need to actually go after it and go get it. And uh, the biggest play was that Tyreek Hill catch um, after he had one taken away upon review. Um, you know, that got them like 40 yards in, in, in one he, chunk. he make a quick move on that one, too? Mahomes really didn't have to make a great throw on that. He lollipopped it because he, he had time. He was so open. He had time to, you know, because they were trying to double Hill and Kelsey uh, at times all over the field. Um, there was times where they had Richard Sherman on Kelsey, and luckily Kelsey just pretty much dogged it on those plays, yeah, yeah. Uh, or else he could have had a bigger day um, which with the way Sherman uh, played in that game. But they were really trying to focus on doubling Tyreek Hill, and on that play you can try and do it, but if a quarterback has too much time, you've seen these speed guys, you saw Randy Moss do it for years, he'll just run away and run away from the coverage didn't you think that was coming to right all game long i'm waiting for hill or someone to streak down the sidelines and just go for 60 it never happened and then seven minutes ago you know you just had a play i think come back or something like that and boom there it is hill makes this great double move gets over the top and is just absolutely nobody near him and mahomes had enough time credit the offensive line to just dart one in there Dart one in there. He, he lollipopped it, but Hill was yeah. wide open. But the the Chiefs got. I mean, obviously they needed to be desperate. They needed to be aggressive. Um, and I you know give credit to Andy Reid for in those late game situations where we like to malign him. Uh, he he called a uh, a great game. On the flip side, and and this is where we can dig into some numbers. Man, Shanahan just has is now built. It's one of those things where it happens once. Okay, it doesn't have to define you. It happens twice. Now you start to kind of really build a bad image, and it starts. One of those things does it start to creep into your own head, um, as a, especially as a play caller. Um, you know, for those of you who might not know, uh, the Forty ers head coach Kyle Shanahan was the offensive coordinator for the Atlanta Falcons against the New England Patriots, a team that blew a twenty-eight to three lead late in the third quarter to go on and lose in overtime. Uh, and I think what we can tell just from those two big games is that he just does not have a sense or a feel for the game and what it needs. He didn't have it against the Patriots. When you have a 25-point lead, maybe you should be running the ball. Even if you don't You don't need to score anymore. You literally just need to kill the clock. Um, and your defense has to not give up big plays. And the other team just doesn't even have time. Um it's like he thought they had a bigger lead than they did last night because it was the same thing. You should have just been running the ball. And really where, where where this game turned, we'll go to the drive chart here. Um, Niners get the interception off Pat Mahomes. Um, and what they do is, and that, that was when it was 20 to 10. If you get any points there, that's huge. Um, instead, they go five plays, 17 yards. They do take up three minutes. At least that's some time. Um, but they got away from the run. Um, if I pull up the exact drive chart here. So, you know, first and 10. Mostert, off right tackle for six yards. Next play, uh, Garoppolo to Kittle, which was a horrid throw, an insane catch by Kittle, but he bails him out. Um, so now it's first down uh, at their own 38. One yard for Mostert. And then it's second and nine, and uh, it's a spot where it looks like Shanahan just says, nope, uh, I'm not going to run the ball anymore. And passing complete, false start. Now it's third and long. Garoppolo has to scramble, fourth down. 
punt. So you really haven't changed field position. You didn't take a bunch of time off the clock, and you give the ball back. Kansas City goes ripping right down the field. Ten plays, but only two minutes and 40 seconds. It's 20-17. to 17. You should have a sense of urgency, but you still have the lead. And the Niners on their next possession, three plays, five yards, 69 seconds. Run off left tackle for five yards for Mostert. And then what do the Niners immediately do? Pass, pass, punt. And I think that's just, it's second and five. Run it again. I mean, in the first half, the when they went down to go tie the game, and even on their first drive, in the first half, the Niners were just sticking to the run um, because it was working, and the, the Chiefs couldn't stop it. And then in the biggest moment of the game, you know, it's as if he wanted to put it in Garoppolo's hands on purpose so that it's like it's like uh, Pete Carroll calling a pass play on the one yard line because they wanted Russell. It wanted to be Russell who wins the championship this time. It's his. Um, so you go punt and then, you know, the rest, the Chiefs, you know, you, you knew it was going to happen. The Chiefs got the ball back. You tell them they have four downs and four minutes and all they got to do is get a touchdown with that talent. It was inevitable. Um, and then afterwards, you know, well, give you know, give me your thoughts on on that whole Kyle Shanahan sequence before we get to. I'm, I know what you want to get to, which is yeah. to rag on Jimmy Garoppolo a little bit. Yeah, but I, I'll even go back further than further than that. How about at the end of the second quarter? Like, what are you doing, dude? You have like two minutes. Not, you have a chance here to do a double score, whether that's three and seven, three and three, whatever it might be. It's ten ten. You have three timeouts, and you could see John Lynch, the owner of the 49ers, sitting up there in the box like, timeout, what are we doing? They just get the ball back at the end of the second quarter, and Shanahan's like, I don't trust my quarterback, I guess, because they don't even try anything. Uh, they have that uh, P.I. call on Kittle where he he threw it down the sideline to Kittle, probably his best throw of the day. Kittle made a play on it, but it was called back for offensive P.I. Which, which, I, which I thought was a back. Like It is O.P.I., but it's like they had to call one. They had it in their back pocket. The the, the officials had the, the mandate, you must call one offensive pass interference uh, to make up for the fact that we didn't call it on Kyle Rudolph. You know, we'll placate people. Um, I didn't think you should have called it because it's not like he threw the guy to the ground. They're running stride for stride. And he had to reach out for the ball anyways. It's not like I didn't think it helped him that much. I think the, the the language is there is to gain a significant advantage. Really? Yeah, I'm on the other side of it actually. I, I I I thought that was a bad call. You don't. It's it wasn't that egregious in my mind. The only reason he got separation on the play was because he extended just a little bit out of the way, and you could see that tiny bit of separation open up. And it was a great ball, and he might have caught it anyway. But he did push off, and it, I, I mean, I think it was pi. Whether you call it in that spot, maybe in the regular season, it's a no brainer. Um, I didn't mind the call. Because those thought, those three points, I mean that that's a whole it's a completely different game with those three points on the board. Yeah, uh, I I also think the one time I remember him throwing to Kittle, two times was he threw it basically into the dirt and Kittle made a tremendous play, and then that pi that was called back. I I, I wonder if he knew if he knows he has Kittle on his team because he, he you know Shanahan kind of let him cut it loose a little bit in the fourth, and he didn't really go after him much. That's like you're Rob Gronkowski. Brady's going to go there no matter what, double coverage, whatever it is. You got to go to him. Yeah, I mean, we can we can get into the, some of that um, too. Um, the the play calling. You know, while we're on Shane, at the end, um, this this will be this will be more Shanahan rag ripping along, along with Garoppolo. Um, Garoppolo did not come through in that moment. You know, we talked about will Jimmy G have a moment? Uh, he had an opportunity to have uh, his moment. Here you go. You're down four. You have the ball. Go get us a Plenty touchdown. Plenty of time, too. Plenty of time. Timeouts. Go win a Super Bowl. And he didn't come through. Uh, I mean, it's the the glaring one is the missed throw to Emmanuel Sanders. That could have been. <laughs> that ball was in the air. I was like, oh, my God, he's got him. He was open. A yeah, 50, was this open. is going to be a 50-yard dart to win the Super Bowl. Um, he and he overthrew him. Ten yards. Um, a, a little bit of maybe happy feet and then, and then throwing early um, and, and not on time. Uh, and maybe that's because of some of the pressure getting to him, um, which is a great stat on that. Um, you know, the difference between the two quarterbacks is how they handled pressure. Um, 
Mahomes was basically under pressure all night and, and still was able to be effective and efficient. Garoppolo, under pressure, one for nine for 20 yards and two picks when he was pressured. Not good. I will say, though, I did not like the spots that Shanahan put him in on that last drive. You could tell the Chiefs were bringing heat, and they kept two guys in the backfield. They kept a running back, and they kept Kittle, who you said, Christian. That's like that's their most important weapon. That is Garoppolo's favorite toy. And instead of having him out there flexed, maybe you start Max Protect, you know, a, the split backfield and shotgun, and you spread it out once you get to the line of scrimmage, once you see they're bringing heat. There was no outlets for Garoppolo. They just said, well, they're bringing seven. We'll have seven guys back here blocking, and hopefully, you know, one of my other three guys gets open. They didn't, you know, they kept both guys into either chip and, I mean, Kittle would release sometimes very late. I just thought that was a bizarre formation and just designed to say, I want to keep guys in to protect and not utilize one of my best pass catchers at yeah. all on the final drive, pretty much. It was, um, it was really, really, really bizarre strategy. Uh, yeah, and, and on top of that, you know, two things that I thought uh, were very odd of Shanahan to do. So just going back a little bit, you come out in the second half, you get a field goal. Then the interception happens and you score a touchdown. Another interception. And then you get the ball back up 20 to 10. And you go five plays and a punt in three minutes. Just like the other thing, real quick, the two players that I thought the Niners did not use enough was Mostert again, right? 12 carries for 58 yards. He averaged like five five yards a carry, but he only got 12. And they had chances to run the ball. Much like in that Super Bowl, you know, it's just glaring similarities between that Super Bowl between the Patriots and Falcons and now this one is, dude, you're up 10. All you got to do is chip away here, use the clock, and run the ball, which you've done all year. And the other thing was they didn't, yeah, like you mentioned, they did not use Kittle well in this game at all. They didn't even give him, I, I don't remember a play where they were like, you know what, let's put him outside. No matter the coverage, just toss one up there. Let him make a play. He's the best tight end in football. You think they maybe want to go after that matchup, especially the way like someone like Sherman I didn't think was great in this game, and they just they just didn't do enough. You know, I mean, um, between Kittle and Kelsey, Kelsey was on Sherman a bunch. They went right at him. On the other side, you know, Kittle, they just didn't target him enough. No, I, I I think, I mean, he's, we talked uh, in our preview about how the tight ends are going to be the, the focal points, really, of both offenses. Both teams love to go to those guys on third down and in big spots. And, you know, give the Chiefs defense some credit for for making life tough uh, on, on Kittle. Um, you know, I think he only had, let me see if I can pull this up. George Kittle, he only had uh, four receptions and 36 yards um, to Kelsey, who had six for 43, but he had the touchdown. But Kelsey's also in the offense where there's so many other weapons right. around that are going to draw attention that his presence is is opening things up um, for them. You know, the Niners, yes. I mean, Debo Samuel, great rookie. Emmanuel Sanders is a, is a fantastic wide receiver. Um, their focus is to be more balanced. And to throw to Kittle. Kittle is, you know, like you said, a focal point, probably their best player on offense. Um, one of their best players on offense. And, you know, to only have, let me see, seven targets, that's that's not enough. Especially, you know, in, you know, I have to go look. I mean, I think he was targeted maybe once on that final drive. And I was, I, I was looking, um, they're lining up and I'm saying, Where's Kittle? Where's Kittle? Why is he not? That's where we've seen the Patriots do it. Gronkowski. The Chiefs do it. Kelsey. They split them out wide and see who's out there. Oh, it's a linebacker covering them. This is, you know, you know oh, we're going to go right at that matchup. They stuck Kittle in the backfield. I mean, it's just. Yeah, and you know what? I don't even remember that, that them, That's poor coaching. I don't remember them. You know, Gronk would move around, right? They'd move him outside, then move him into the slot, move him off to the right side to block, and then, you know, chip and go. I don't remember them moving him around a lot to get him open. 
So I don't think they set him up very well. Yeah, and there wasn't very much design plays. Yeah. Um, they designed plays for the fullback. I thought that was a great thing is that for a while I thought, hey, if the Niners win the way this game's going, Garoppolo hasn't had a fantastic game. You know, He wasn't blowing anything away. Kyle Juszczyk, what were the odds on that? He that, can that play, guy, too. That that guy could have been MVP. Um, obviously, the Chiefs come back, and, and Mahomes is is MVP. Um, and I, I guess we'll stick with Mahomes now. Um, you know, if if this continues for the Chiefs, can can it continue? Um, has has Mahomes now in in you know, in his first two years as a starter, he's been league MVP, um, lost in an AFC Championship at home, uh, and then wins the Super Bowl. Uh, in in comeback fashion. Granted, I didn't think he had a great game, but that's what the greats do. You know, they're not having a great game. They dig down. They find a way to win. Tom Brady was having one of his worst Super Bowls ever against both the Falcons and the Seahawks, and found ways to in the yeah. fourth quarter elevate himself. Um, that's what the great ones do. Um, has the Pat Mahomes era officially begun? And how long can it last? Yes, I mean he's twenty four, which is insane. And he's got that thing. So, it, you know, it depends. I mean, will they be able to surround him like this all the time with Hill and these guys? Watkins is probably gone after this year. So that's one guy out the door, but they can just replace him with uh, Hardman or someone like that. Um, I don't think they, they will go on like a New England style run, but they're going to be there. You know, he could be that, you know, Peyton Manning type guy where he's always in the in the conversation. And I think he has a little bit more... Uh, stonage than uh than Peyton did so he could he could you know it's crazy that he's 24 and this early on but it all comes down to if you want to go on a great run it'll be more than just you know one player and it'll come down to the finite details coaching things like that so you it's all got to pull together and their defense was excellent this year once they kind of got going a little bit with guys like Matthew and Chris Jones so they made some good moves in terms of how long it can go, um, I think as long as Mahomes is there, they're going to be in the conversation at least. That's at the very least. Um, and he's got to stay healthy, obviously. But, you know, as long as he's there, that's the most important position in the game. Uh, and they've got him for a while, and he's going to make a billion dollars. On the flip side, uh, Jimmy G can't come up big in in his moment. Um, Niners are paying him an awful lot of money, and it seems whether through um, – Play calling at times, design, um, his own shortcomings. Garoppolo seems like he's good, not great. Um, can the Niners get back? I mean, the only team we've seen recently in recent history that can get back to a Super Bowl after losing it is the Patriots, which are a talk about an exception to the rule. I mean, it's Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. Um, you know, they're the only team that's been able. All these other teams. Look what happened to the Rams this year. Yeah. People people put money right away. All oh, the Rams and the Pats, they'll be back. This we could get a rematch. Uh and the Rams it 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 does something to a team psychologically to lose a Super Bowl anyways, let alone to have it in your hands and to squabble it away. Um what's the future for Jimmy G um and can the Niners get back? I think Jimmy G man, I thought I don't know what happened really because you know, he, he showed some poise. Um, I don't know if it was the injury or what, but, man, he he had happy feet a lot last night. And when they called him on called on him, uh, he was not great. So, obviously, he wasn't ready for the moment. We can just say that. Will they get back? I think they'll be in the conversation, you know, with the defense they have. They have some good linebackers. They'll still be there. But I don't know. There's something, there's something just not right about the whole – Jimmy G situation. He's making a hell of a lot of money to be a passenger on that team. And, you know, whether that's changing up the play calling or giving him some type of confidence, because he, he looked kind of lost in, in some of those moments last night. Yeah. It, what's crazy is we talk about the, the great quarterbacks um, find a way late. They elevate themselves. Um, that last throw that he missed to Sanders, what's crazy is like, Eli Manning makes that throw. Yeah. Nick Foles makes that throw. Like the guys who have had bad Super Bowls, maybe not the greatest quarterbacks, they make that they, they make that throw in in the big moments. Uh you know, we've seen that in in recent history. And that's how you go that's how you can be a 
somewhat middle of the road quarterback, but if you come through in those big spots, Garoppolo kind of seems like eh, he's 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 just not great under pressure at all, and that he can't he's just steady. He he is what he is. He doesn't often tail off, and he's not elevating himself either. You just are going to get the same consistent performance throughout a game. And I don't know. I think that's a lot of money to be paying for a guy that's just going to do that. You could get Andy Dalton to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's not he's not like Jared Goff. He's better than Jared Goff, but he's not Mahomes or that style. He's somewhere in the middle and it, there's just something I you know, I think he can play. He's I, entrenched in tier 2. Yeah, exactly. And I I think he can play, but for that money, oof, he's getting paid know. like top 3 money to be entrenched in Here you go. Comparison who would you rather had, Matt Stafford or Jimmy Garoppolo? Yeah, I mean, From a, a stats comp, yeah. and an ability standpoint, what those guys accomplish on the field, very similar. I mean, if you very, put very Sta- similar. if you put Stafford on the 49ers team, I think it'll look similar and maybe even better if Stafford's on that team. Yeah, like well, that, Stafford know? overthrows Sanders by 40 yards on that, that but he's last got play. a missile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he puts that ball up into the stand through the uprights and good. Um. I don't think the Niners get back next year. I think they're going to struggle. I think um, the Seahawks are, are going to improve. Uh, I think the Cardinals will be better. I think they're in a very, very, very... I mean, they were they were an inch away from having to be a wild card team this year alone. And so I just think the the mental grind of what's going to happen to them in an offseason, and I don't think... I think, I think if Shanahan... Um, can get their heads all squared on straight. They can be a playoff team again. I don't give them a shot to get back to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I don't think maybe not. Probably not next year. I would say, but you know, in the future at some point, can Jimmy G get back? Absolutely. I, I don't see why not. And um, next year, I you know teams teams like that that have a hard. I mean, just look at the Seahawks. It took them a little bit to get back rolling, um, and the one constant was a quarterback. So um, they're in a tough spot. I think they'll be back, but, you know, they'll be in contention for playoffs and things like that, but they won't get back to the Super Bowl. All right, so we're going to turn we're going to turn our attention now to uh some Celtics and NBA trade deadline uh action. Plenty happening today already with the Celtics uh, reports that they're interested in Clint Capella um and trade deadlines a couple days away and there's just sure to be a lot of action. Hopefully, I mean, the last couple of years, Christian, we've had these years where there's just all this action. We're analyzing emojis on Twitter, and then uh, trade deadline comes in. Not many Woj bombs lately. Not many Woj bombs. Um, but to discuss the Celtics, um, the NBA, and the Celtics salary cap, and the NBA at large, uh, we're going to welcome into the show now a good friend of mine, Matt Murphy. Um, whenever I have a Celtics or cap-related question when it uh, in regards to the NBA, I turn to Matt because... Uh, though he may not have uh, a distinguished uh, capologist title, um, he is uh, he's the cap expert in my mind, um, and I'll let him explain a little bit about uh, how we got into the NBA salary cap, uh, and we're going to ask him all sorts of questions. Uh, he he's going to become our uh, our resident capologist. So without any further ado, uh, Matt Murphy, welcome to the show. Hey guys, how's it going? Hey, uh, so I'm a so I'm a. Uh... Get, get close with the mic. You get, you know, get real intimate with it? Intimate okay. Go. All right. Right on. All right. I just didn't want to bump heads with you. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm a research engineer by day, but I guess MBA salary cap enthusiast by night. Um, and so how I sort of got into this was, um, well, originally I was super into the NFL and just sort of following the NFL and the different moves and everything was really straightforward. Um, and then whenever I would look at the NBA, there were just these trades that didn't make any sense, you know, and there would be, you know, a, a really solid player traded with a draft pick for a player who will probably never play in the NBA. And I'd be like, what is this? This doesn't make any sense. How can I even follow along what's, what, you know, what's even happening in this league? So eventually I just got fed up with it and uh, started to do my own research. Um, and there's a lot of good res- uh, resources online. One of them is Larry Kuhn, FAQs. Um, but yeah, basically just sort of did a deep dive into the NBA salary cap and was sort of surprised by what I, what I found. It's a lot more complicated than what I thought originally. Um, but just sort of to keep it high level um, and just to, to understand some of the moves that could be happening over the next week, um, it's important to understand you know, the different 
uh, places in which the, a team operates. Um, so basically you have teams that are either under the cap, over the cap, or over the tax. Um, and so based on where you stand, you're afforded different exceptions to go over the cap. Um, and the biggest one that you can get is if you're just over the cap, but not under, sorry, over the cap, but not over the tax. Um, and that's where the NBA wants you to be. They want you to be spending lots of money, but not spending it egregiously. So that's not fair for the smaller market teams. Right. Um, and so depending on which region the team falls into, they're going to behave differently and they're going to view and value players differently. Right. Um, and so, uh, just a quick little note here that I wanted to, to go over before diving into some trade, uh, some of the trade rules is, you know, one of the things that was thrown around originally was when I was looking, at this was, uh, bird rights and cap holds and like, what the heck is all of this? And the NFL doesn't have this at all. It's just a straight up hard cap. And when you have salary cap space, you fill it and it's pretty straightforward. Um, so basically when you hear the term bird rights thrown around, it's when, uh, well, basically it came about when the Celtics back in the day, they ran out of cap space and they wanted to re-sign Larry Bird. And they petitioned the league to get an exception to go over the cap to sign him. So then all the other teams were like, well, that's stupid. We want to be able to do that too. So, you know, so they, they, this bird rights, um, rule came about, but then what happened was teams were abusing it and they were going out and signing other free agents and then going over the cap to resign their own players with bird rights. So they added a new rule that, uh, when you have your own free agent, there's a cap hold associated with that. That way you can't just abuse this rule. So you can sort of see the trend here. The CBA is just, you know, a, a list of rules that weren't that great. So then they added more rules to patch it up, which creates more loopholes. It, it's the English language of salary caps. Yeah, basically. And so then you've got these these brilliant minds like Danny Ainge and Daryl Morey who try to find any way they can to take advantage of it and find different loopholes, this type of stuff that would make Bill Belichick blush. Um so yeah, that's sort of an overview of, of where teams operate. And just as a side note, um, there's a lot of talk in the media of, you know, te- players don't want to come to the Celtics, um, especially this was a few years back. And uh, the thing is, the Celtics were actually over the cap for almost 20 years. Um, so one of the things that was interesting uh, back in 2015 was, um, and this is actually when I started getting into it, they were, there was an announcement that was, oh, the Celtics have renounced the, the rights to Shaquille O'Neal and Stefan Marbury and Scott Pollard. I'm like, what the heck? What, those guys haven't played for the Celtics in forever. Like, why is that even a thing? Um, and it just turned out the Celtics had been over the cap for so many years that they never bothered to renounce those cap holds because they just didn't have to because they could never create cap space. Um, but it was sort of a unique situation where they could clear those cap holds and then um, use their cap space to bring in Amir Johnson, David Lee. Um, and then it just so worked out that Jay Crowder had a low cap hold. So then once they filled, uh, their cap space with those other players, they were able to go back over the cap to re-sign Jay Crowder. Um, so yeah, those are the types of things that, that teams are keeping in mind, um, as they head into the off season. And especially at the trade deadline, they want to position themselves to make decisions of whether or not they're going to be under the cap, over the cap, or an over the tax team. Um, so we're going to get into some some trade scenarios, but first we need to gr- lay down the, the ground rules here. Um, so there's two types of trades, right? There's what are called non-simultaneous and simultaneous. So uh, non-simultaneous trade, uh, sort of like the trade I mentioned earlier, where it was just sort of a, a decent player and a draft pick sent to a team with cap space for essentially nothing. What that does is it generates a trade exception uh, at the amount of the player that was sent out. Um, and so that sort of makes sense. It's non-simultaneous because you can complete the trade later with that trade exception. Um, and then the other is a simultaneous trade, which is the one that's a lot more interesting and and um, it's how you can sort of aggregate salaries in order to bring back a player making even more. So uh, there's three different brackets for that. If you're under six and a half million outgoing salary, you can bring back 175% of that outgoing salary. 
And then between six and a half and 19.8, you can bring back 5 million. And then if you are over that 19.6, um, you can bring back 120, or sorry, 125%. Um, I hope everybody's keeping notes at home. If you, if you, we, we should have had the disclaimer, uh, get your pads and pens out people. Uh, there's going to be some math involved. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to lay this out first. We should publish the, the, the notes afterwards. It's like when you miss like a class, like, oh, well, you missed the class, but the whole presentation will be available afterwards online. Right. Basically, what we, you're going to do is, is twist yourself into a pretzel while you're listening to this right? to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, th- th- this is what we have Matt for, though. I mean, we don't need to know. We just need to know the guy that knows. <laughs> right. Yeah, I get a little bit ca- too caught up in the numbers because I'm an engineer. Um but there, actually, there's a lot of great resources on online, ESPN's uh, Trade Machine. And then also there's another website, trademba.com, I think it's called, that's that's really good for, for this so that you don't have to sit there with a spreadsheet or calculator and, and do the math. It'll figure it out for you. And a bottle um, of whiskey. And a bottle of whiskey, yeah. Um, so, yeah, j- just based off of that, it's, it's pretty obvious that um, – it'll be difficult for the Celtics to bring back a player making a significant amount of money just because um, they've already sort of listed certain guys as untouchable, right? They they have the Jays, uh, Smart, um, Kemba, Hayward, that they've all sort of listed as like, we're not moving these guys, right? So who's next on the list? It's Cantor and Tice, and they're only making around 5 million. So it's going to be really hard to get up into that we're not going to get into that range of over 19 million right we're going to be able to basically bring back a player who's making 18 million or less um do you do you think that hayward is untouchable like that they actually want him to be untouchable or is this the isaiah thomas effect where you know anthony davis says i don't want to go to the celtics because of what they did to it and if they traded hayward after he got hurt and he's kind of had an up and down return is 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 he untouchable because of that or because they actually really value him in your opinion I think they actually really value him and um I think some of the IT stuff is a little overplayed and at least in this situation uh Hayward signed to a max contract he gets hurt um they give him a full year to get back into the swing of things now we're on you know year two and a half right I don't think anyone would really throw stones for trading him, especially given the situation they have with the two young wing players. Um, but one potential trade that could actually be interesting um, that would might make Hayward pretty happy would be a return to Indiana. Um, and so, so that would involve essentially Hayward going to the Pacers and the Celtics receiving uh, Miles Turner and potentially one other player sort of as like a medium salary player. Um, I kind of actually wanted to get your, your guys' opinion on that. What do you thought of Miles Turner on the Celtics? So it would be just straight up like Miles Turner for Gordon Hayward or like what, like what's the whole setup there with that? Well, well, yeah. So, I mean, we would be, we would have to take back an extra player just because of how much Hayward is making, but it's all, it all sort of comes down to, how you value the two right so from the pacers standpoint um they're over the cap and they're going to be over the cap for a while so they they need to get a player uh in return for turn of that you know is going to help them um and so basically yeah they 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 already have sabonis um they're sort of trying to juggle that double big front court and it's it's hasn't really affected the team's success sort of like with Boston everyone was like oh Celtics have way too many wings um it's one of those things that on paper you go yeah this trade makes sense of Celtics wing for a Pacers big um but both teams are winning so it, it's going to be interesting to see if if either side's willing to budge to to break things up I mean I think personally I'm with you. I think I don't think they should give up on on Hayward. Oh, feedback. Uh, I don't think they should give up on, on Hayward. Um, I also think that at least Turner is a player who can do more than just he's more than just your regular big. I mean, Christian, I don't know how, how you feel about. I mean, I I'm, I'm I'm in the room with two of the biggest Gordon Hayward fans in the entire world. 
Um, so the idea of trading Hayward, I can see there's already little beads of sweat forming on, on both of their foreheads. But uh, Turner's a guy that at least he can kind of shoot. You know, the we'll get into the Clint Capella rumors. Um, I think the Celtics already have no. Clint, Clint Capella on their roster. Um, we can discuss that. But, I mean, how do you feel about uh, Turner, Christian? I'm a, I'm a fan of Turner, yeah. I think he's pretty good. I'm not giving up Hayward probably, but um, – which kind of makes that trade move. just for fun. I did a, a, a quick little uh, Hayward for Miles Turner and TJ Warren, which probably would never happen. Um, and that went six, su- uh, that was successful just because of the salaries match up pretty or pretty close. But uh, I'm a yes on miles Turner, but for the right price. And I don't think they could get it done with what they have. I'm not giving up too much for him, even though, like you said, he can do a lot more than just stand in the uh, paint for three seconds and score twos all the time. So, uh, if you're going to get a guy, especially for Brad Stevens, you got to get a guy that can shoot. But uh, for what we'd have to give up, I'm a no. Uh, but I do like the player. So that that that's that's our opinion. We 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 don't want to sell Gordon Hayward. I don't either. <laughs> but I'm uh I've been sort of biased towards Hayward and my love for Gordon Hayward. So I wanted to throw that out there right away. Um, that you know maybe it is an option. Um, but hopefully not. I think Marcus Smart earlier today said that uh, he hopes that Danny Ainge doesn't do anything crazy in regards to Gordon Hayward. I thought that was an interesting comment. Um, another potential move for Turner, and I really like Turner because I sort of look at Tice as like a prototype of what they want in their center, right? A guy who can switch, a guy who can protect the rim. He can give you a five out look, shooting threes, um, really good pick and roll player. And so... You know, one move in order to get it done, just with the salaries they have, they could move um, Langford, uh, Tice, and Cantor. Um, obviously, your your depth at center would take a big hit, depending on how healthy Time Lord can stay. Um, but yeah, what do you guys think of that potential move? Um, who are you giving those guys up for, Turner? Turner, yeah, there'd probably yeah. be a third team involved because um, they're probably not going to take on Cantor, and then sort of the draft pick negotiation sort of goes from there. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm a no on that just because I think Tice, you know, Tice is kind of like a Swiss Army knife. He doesn't do do anything great, but he does everything well enough, and he does what they want him to do. He he's good inside. Um, he can also defend the three point line, which is important because Cantor is a guy that he can't really defend at all, but when he defends, it's more of uh, he's better at the pick and roll than he is at the three point line. Uh, so giving up two centers for Turner, I don't know how I feel about that with your depth there because as much as I love Grant Williams and his great five minutes, uh, <laughs> I'm a no with him at the five. So Rob Williams worries me with injuries. So in terms of needs for the Celtics right now, I, I'm more of a – you need some guy that can come in maybe after Brown or Tatum and score ten quick points in ten minutes or something like that. Okay. Well, uh, repeat the question. <laughs> we were we were setting Matt up with a pair of headphones so he can actually hear himself talk. So uh, really quickly, uh, what's the trade? Oh, this was sort of uh, moving away from. This is saying you know Hayward is essentially untouchable, and how else could we get it done? Um, and so being able to aggregate the salaries of Cantor, Tice, and Langford. Um, and one of the reasons why the Pacers could be interested, um, you know, they, they like to put butts in seats, basically, and, and that was a huge deal with the Victor Oladipo trade, so Langford's an Indiana guy. Um, Cantor would probably be going to a third team, and the Pacers would be getting Tice and maybe a draft pick. Um, but again, it's sort of it's sort of like, you know, Tice is sort of like your off-brand Turner, and can you get more by just keeping the continuity of 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 Tice in house and maybe um Time Lord is able to sort of overtake him as the starting center. Yeah, I'm 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 going to go that route. I mean, I think I'm not a fan of tinkering too much. It's kind of one of those things it's like diminishing returns. You know, I think they got very lucky this year that Kyrie Irving didn't work out and then you're able to get Kemba Walker and kind of like open up the window again, you lose Al Horford, and then so you still now can build with, you know, when you let Pierce and Garnett go, and Jason Terry, people forget about Jason Terry, but he was a part of that deal too. Oh, um, and and you, you get, you know, the draft picks you got, and you set yourself up with all those assets. 
you know, it could have gone really sideways after last year and the fact that the major pieces of those assets are still in place and you have Hayward and you have some young guys. I feel like if you try to start like, let's combine these guys to get this other kind of mid mid level type guy, you just start consolidating all your assets into not much. So I think I think I'd want to keep Tice because he was such a steal and and Bob Williams for his upside. Well you have the right you have right now if if Williams is healthy, you have three guys that can do a little bit of everything. Williams is your standard shot blocker in the middle. Cantor's your rebounder, and Tice can do just about everything. He can shoot the three. So I don't think you want to give up too much to get one guy in return and then you know ship off one of your young prospects in uh, Langford. Okay, keeping on the trend of centers, what do we think about Capella? I think that Bob Williams is Capella. I mean, I think I mean it, they already have that guy. You have a guy that can when he's on the floor. He's the injured version. Yeah, he's the yeah. injured version of Clint Capella. Um, uh, he can run the floor. He's long. He's athletic. He can play above the rim. I mean, earlier this year, the Celtics' offense when he was healthy, he was supposed to be the starting center, as as you mentioned, and they were running the same type of offense, just the high pick and roll and letting him run at the rim and throwing him. Lob. I mean, he was getting like five or six lobs a game and he was incredibly efficient. Um, now, obviously he's hurt. I don't know how much, you know, you get Clint Capella, you have to play him, right? It's not like you get Clint Capella to come in and play Rob Williams minutes. So you I feel like your whole offense kind of changes um, with a guy like that. If you're going to make him play 30 something minutes, um, I feel like they are hopeful that Bob Williams can stay healthy. Um, I'm not really in on Capella. I mean, I think it's intriguing because, um, you know, maybe you'd essentially be getting him just to get rebounds. And I think there's probably options maybe on the buyout market for that. If you just want to get a situational big, there's also Taco Fall. Um, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> talk about putting butts in seats. That guy puts butts in seats. Actually, he gets people's butts out of seats. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but he puts he puts those butts in the arena to do whatever they will. Um, moving on, Christian. Yeah, what do you think about Clint Capella? Uh, yeah. He, well, here's what I'll say. I keep going back and forth. Earlier, I said no, but I I keep going back and forth on this because you have guys in the Eastern Conference like Giannis and uh, Embiid, where you'd need a bigger guy. And Tice did well the other day, but we've lost three times to Philly already, so he hasn't done that well. And uh, but today, I'm a no. Uh, tomorrow maybe a yes, but I don't know. Um, he's intriguing because of he can defend and he's a bigger guy that we we don't really have. Um, I, I mean Rob Williams, I guess, but he's he's an injury risk at this point. I don't know how often you're going to get him on the floor. Um, today I'll say no. Tomorrow talk to me. And, and I think Matt, I mean you can talk about this right now. It's going to come down to cost too. I mean, I think. From what I, from my rudimentary understanding of the NBA salary cap, <laughs> I'm something of a capologist myself. Um, I, I think it's going to take. I mean, if you want to go straight up, it'd have to be somebody like Smart or or Hayward, because um, you. I mean, the the Jays aren't touchable, um, and if not, you'd have to get three teams involved, right? Potentially. Yeah. So this is this is a good good time to introduce the another loophole that is really taken advantage of. I'm going to call it the stepping stone trade. Um, so, so I was talking about you can, based on your outgoing salary, you can bring back a player making more money. But what if after you do that, you just do it again, right? So you trade, you trade a player who's making, you know, 5 million more, and then you trade that next player for another player making 5 million more, right? And so um, one of the rules is that you can't then combine that player with another player. So it's kind of tricky, but... It would basically be like the Celtics, you know, agreeing to a trade in principle with three teams, but it's really like a two separate trades where the Celtics would be making a move for a player who's, you know, maybe like, um, I'm trying to think, on like Roberson maybe, like any sort of expiring contract, a player who's making a decent amount of money, and then sort of flipping that player to a third team uh, in order to have the salary to take back capella but i agree i think um it's sort of one of those deals and it's like with turner you know tice is sort of like turner but he can't do it for 30 minutes um time lord's sort of like capella but he can't do it for 30 minutes and 
there's something to be said for just sort of playing out this year and then evaluating what those guys can do in the playoffs. Uh, I said it earlier. I don't know if I said it to you, Matt, um, or I've sent this. I've said this numerous places in a group text, but the Celtics have like an all-time big man on their team if they could combine Tice, Williams, and Cantor. Like you need the athleticism of Bob Williams. Sort of like a transformer. Yeah, 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 yeah. The 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 shooting ability um, of uh, of Tice. You know his 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 he's got an outside shot. And just like the rebounding savvy that Cantor has, like especially like on the offensive end, if you could like, you know, Brad Stevens monster, like that's 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 what they. If you could somehow just combine all of those, what if you added in uh, Vin Poirier's uh, awkwardness? His how would that be good? All I want from Poirier is those bright red shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looked like uh, you ever seen that movie, that old Disney movie, The Luck of the Irish? He looked like the uh, uh, Seamus McTiernan from that show the other night. <laughs> um. I mean, I guess you could also say, I mean, if, if, I mean, Matt, what, what's your opinion? I mean, we, we've talked about Taco Fall a little bit here. Um, fans talk about, you know, they, they want to see Taco like, we have a big, these guys, 7-7, seven, seven, just put him in the game. Well, you need a big man. He's right there. Um, I'm, I like Taco. I mean, I think they're kind of using him as a bit of an oddity just to like, you know, uh, play up in Portland and, and develop, um, I think it, you know, the the people running the Celtics, Danny Ainge and Brad Stevens, aren't dumb. Um, if if this guy could actually legitimately play starters minutes or against cal- NBA caliber players, they'd be playing him, especially you know against uh, Embiid and some of these other bigger teams, you know, just to see what he can do. Um, to me, it seems like they're worried that he's going to get absolutely owned, and they don't want to ruin his mental state because of that. Uh, what's your take with Taco Fall? So I think it's definitely a little bit of both. Um, the marketing is is a real thing. I can tell you that from experience. Um, where I work, we have an office in Portland, and last year I went there to uh, to go to my first main Red Claws game because I actually wanted to see Bob Williams. And uh, there was like a leaky roof; the game got canceled. But I had bought like courtside seats of like thirty bucks. Um, so I was looking into it this year. Those same seats are like one hundred thirty bucks, and this is a G League game, right? So. Uh, Taco's doing big things for, for that franchise in Maine. Um, but he, he, he has shown major improvement, um, from summer league. And I think, you know, projecting out, I could see him as sort of like that, that NBA sort of knuckleball player on your, on your depth chart, sort of like a Boban where it's just like, based on the matchup and the situation, he could help save you in like a game six or seven of a playoff series. Cause you know, maybe you just, nothing else is working and it's like, all right, we can't guard and be, let's just throw our seven foot seven guy out there. That the, the first legitimate minutes he got this year was in a situation like that. They were playing the Spurs at home and they were down 22 to three, like four minutes into the game and Brad Stevens put taco in. Um, it wasn't all that great. Um, no, it wasn't, yeah. but, um, you know, not you were, much was on that game, though. So. There really, really was not a lot. Um, I mean, you you were uh, a basketball player, Matt. I mean, if if you were a coach, um, you know, h- how often do you say have a situation where you're like, well, I just want to throw this guy in to see what he can do, or is there just way too much at stake in in NBA games for coaches really to be doing that and saying, well, I, you know, I'm kind of curious, can Taco guard and bead? Like, like you said, maybe to have in your back pocket down the line in a playoff series, why haven't we seen him get those kinds of minutes just in regular season games where the stakes aren't as high? So, I mean, definitely part of it is, a, is an evaluation. You know, you want to see him against certain matchups and then have that film to be able to sort of digest that and um, see see his progression throughout the season. But also you have to hold players accountable and, and a lot of it comes back to, you know, practice. And then for the guys who are bouncing between Boston and Portland, you know, um, those Celtics coaches are really plugged in with the coaches in Maine. And a lot of those coaches end up getting moved up to the Celtics. So there's a lot of synergy there and um, a lot of feedback. And so I think it's just sort of based on how's that player doing in the G League? How are they doing in practice? Um, what's the need for the game right here, right now? Are we up by 20? Is it Geno time? Um, I think there's just a whole, whole bunch of factors at play there. Um, kind of to keep moving along with like the trade scenarios. Um, 
we've had the argument on the show. People have had the discussion, you know, what the Celtics need more. Bench scoring, um, where they really don't have a ton right now. You, know, you basically need, like, your starters to all each basically get you 20 points um, out of, your, like, your big four. You know, the fourth person could be somebody different each night, but at least you need 20 a game out of Kemba, Jalen, and Jason. Sometimes it's Smart giving you offense. Sometimes it's Tatum. Uh, um, excuse me, Hayward. Um in your opinion, which is more important? And if it is bench scoring, and for the people that want bench scoring, where could the Celtics turn uh, at the deadline um, to address that need? So I think if if Bob Williams can get healthy, I like this idea of a of a you know big man by committee, especially since they've moved to this one big system. Um, they're not sort of messing around with having you know Baines is at center and then. Uh, Morris is at power forward and then Horford is sort of flipping back and forth between the two positions like eating up those minutes it's really just three positions they have a guard wing and a big and they're generally playing either three wings or two guards two bigs Um, so if it's sort of that middle tier salary matching I'd like to see them go for a big just because of the amount of money they already have invested at those other positions Um, but they could get a score potentially on a minimum contract. There's a bunch of them out there. Um, Alec Burks on Golden State is um, lighting it up, and he's on a minimum contract. I think we talked about this earlier, but Isaiah Thomas in Washington also on a minimum contract. I, my dad, yeah, uh, who's uh, a very superstitious man, um, doesn't believe the Celtics. You know, it, you need to undo the the. You need to right the wrong of sending Isaiah away. And that until the Celtics do that, they they won't win another championship. So maybe that's that's the avenue here. Bring Isaiah back, which I would love until he starts balling out and then wants to like be the starter again. I don't know. What do you what do you guys think? I don't know if Isaiah could come back and just be like, yeah, I'll just be the bench scorer and then not like. Do you just create like? Does Isaiah become Kyrie? Like, which wh- wh- how horrific would that be? Like, you you just ruin the image of the guy in your own mind. You live long enough to become the thing you hated. Yeah, that's in, that's just putting uh, a uh, I don't know gasoline on the f- already burning fire. I'd say, uh, I would say right the wrongs when he's like forty and you can get him on like a three day contract. That'd be perfect. Right now, definitely not. No more Isaiah. Sorry. Yeah, there there's some uh, especially after the chemistry issues last year. I don't know if I'd want to. Hmm. We have to tread lightly on that. I mean, I think Kemp- S- small man, big personality. He, he's yeah. too. He's too ball dominant. He is. He's very ball dominant. Um, and so is Kemba. But, and it could be interesting because you essentially are would be getting forty eight minutes of of Kemba, right? It would just be forty eight minutes of just a score. But um, I don't know if they need a score in that way. They almost need a guy who can score off the ball. Um, but it is interesting potential reunion. I. I think IT and, and Danny Ainge actually talked last off season about coming back and Danny told him like, look, it's just not the right time. And, you know, maybe like you were saying, maybe it's when he's 40. Um, hopefully it's when he can still play a little, cause that would be an unbelievable, you know, redemption story. Things coming full circle. It, maybe he, he's one of those guys. He comes back, you know, um, and doesn't really play a ton, but he's kind of like a veteran presence. But then it's like there's a playoff series, somebody's hurt, and he comes in and like wins you a game seven, something like that. That would that that would be how uh, it it have to happen. I also think, I mean, I I was huge on Carson Edwards after I was I was big on Carson Edwards coming into the draft day. I watched the draft with Matt, and once it got outside like the top ten, every single pick I was like, it's gonna be Carson Edwards. It's gonna, I I want the Celtics to get Carson. Edwards. We kept getting closer. For end of the first round, why haven't they taken Carson Edwards? Like, I swear to God, he's available in the second round. He's the steal of the draft. Um, dude lit it up in preseason, and then kind of has struggled at least at the NBA level. Um, I think they're hopeful that he can develop into that guy um, to score off the bench. The type of player I think you're alluding to that they need just a strip score. Is there anybody out there that you know, as far as off ball scores, somebody like uh, like a name comes like a Kyle Corver type. I'm just going to stand in the corner. Corver in the corner, just a guy that could shoot five or six from three in like seven minutes, that type of player. Um, so get back to Golden State. They have, I mean, they have all these role players that they've just been giving big minutes um, who've been playing pretty well. So Glenn Robinson the third is an option. Uh, he's on a minimum contract. Again, we can move anyone like um, 
Poirier or, or, you know, Javante Green, like without shaking up the roster too much, we were talking about being concerned with, with chemistry issues. Um, we could just sort of do like a one for one trade there. Um, another name that's interesting is Malik Beasley on, and on, uh, Denver. So they sort of have a situation where they've got a guy in front of them who they just gave an extension to, um, and Beasley's going to be a restricted free agent this year. So, um, his minutes are sort of declining and it was sort of one of those deals where it's like, are we going to go with one or the other? And they've sort of made their choice. So I wonder if we could sort of buy low on Beasley and then it would be interesting for next year to have his restricted free agent rights to be able to match, you know, any sort of offers that come in. It would be more than just, you know, a one year rental like a lot of these other guys would be. Outside of um, the Celtics, what are, you know, when you look into your crystal ball here of, of numbers floating around, um, what what other moves are, are likely to happen um, or are guys that maybe not everybody's talking about, but, you know, because of salary situations, you could see uh, some guys move, um, you know, non, non-Celtics non uh, trade scenarios that could go down um, before Thursday. Um, I think Iguodala to Dallas just needs to happen. Um Dallas has an expiring contract with Courtney Lee. Um, Memphis did a really interesting thing with Igudala. They were just sort of like, you know, hey, hey, man, we know we we did this weird salary dump trade, and normally you'd have to show up to all the meetings and practices, but you're not going to play type of thing. They just told him like, yeah, you don't have to report. You can just work out um, on your own. You can use our facilities if you want, but you're just sort of like a walking, talking asset we don't really view you as a player for us and that's fine. And we're going to trade you. Um, and he was just like, cool, that's great. Thanks for being straight up with me. Um, so, but the one thing is they are holding out for a first round pick. They've said it again and again, they're not going to buy them out. Um, I'm not sure they're going to get a first round pick for them. Um, one of the things they could do to save face is Dallas actually has golden state second round pick. So they could sort of negotiate with them like, Oh, you know, 31st, 32nd pick in the draft. How is that really all that different from a late first? Um, I think that trade needs to happen. It would be a great addition to Dallas um, and give them another wing defender to add to their team for the playoffs. If you had to put, if, if you had to like guess the Celtics are going to do something, um, well, they could do nothing. You know, in, in your mind, what's most likely to happen uh, for the Boston Celtics before, before the trade deadline? And if it's nothing, do you see any guys that could be available on uh, the buyout market um, for them to potentially add um, for the playoff run? So I think what's going to happen is what, what normally happens here is there's going to be a crazy amount of hype leading up to the deadline and then nothing's going to happen. Um, is that what I want to happen? I'm not sure. Um, I Out of all the trades, the potential trades, I like the idea of Miles Turner. I like um, sort of the chemistry that they already have there from Team USA um, but again, anytime you make a big move like that and it's, it's mid season and it's not like a home run. Yes. This is, this is how we get to the finals. It's more of a move for the future. I'd rather those moves happen in the off season. Um, and I think there's a benefit for both teams there to wait until the off season. I think the Pacers owe it to themselves to see how the double big thing will work out. Um, I think the Celtics have some young players they need to still evaluate, um, And, you know, you can sit on your assets for a while, but eventually they dry up, right? And teams that you, or players that you like get traded. Um, We saw that happen with Anthony Davis. Um, And so, yeah, Danny Ainge is going to have to make a decision. Does he make his move now with the deadline or, and, and get a guy that he wants and potentially overpay? Or does he wait until the off season to try to, you know, get the, get the better of some team and some trade, but potentially you know lose those players so you're saying he has to get off his assets yes you see what i did there um christian do you have any other questions for for matt and i mean the the celtic stuff we could go on and on and on and on we tried to you know uh go through it as quickly as we can um if you have any other questions and then we we'll let we'll let matt make his uh his his closing argument if he has anything anything left questions um I don't know, guys like uh, Bertans from Washington, guys like that are going to be on the move. What do you, what do you think about someone like that? You know, wing. You know, a lot of guys are a lot of teams are probably interested in wings right now. So, uh, someone like that, or um, Bogdanovich from Sacramento, someone like that. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, 
Bertans would be like the perfect rental, right? And if we decide that we're at a point where, hey, we can make a run at this thing, um, he's he's gettable. Um, I don't think we would have to give up too much in terms of players. I think he's uh, I think he's making around seven million. Um, so we really wouldn't have to give up that much in terms of salary. Um, the the asking price is probably going to be a first round pick. Um, and again, Danny Ainge has always been reluctant to um, do those types of trades, those mid season trades where you know there's a huge risk there. You're giving up a first round pick, and and is it a dis- you know is there diminishing returns here? Is it actually going to work out? Um, again, it's, it's a tough call. I think that. Uh, Bertans could potentially get moved and I like Ogdanovich um, and again I think he's a restricted free agent so that could be you know it could potentially be more than just a one year rental um, and he's an incredible player um, I don't know how content he would be coming off the bench for the Celtics but um, sort of a guy who I could see maybe thriving in a bigger role but if we could get him for this year that would be fantastic well uh Matt, uh, if do you have anything more that you you want to add? I mean, I, I hope we can make you. Uh, maybe maybe we can have you on after the deadline. To if 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 fireworks actually happen, and we need to sift through all this stuff. Uh, we can have you on to to break it all down. Uh, but uh, really glad you came on. I uh, want to make you a regular of the show. Our our cap expert, uh, Matt Murphy, cap enthusiast. Uh, any other closing words? Yeah, actually, I, I had a, a couple more points or a couple more questions for you guys. Um, so there's two teams right now that are sort of at a crossroads um, and for different reasons. And it's OKC and New Orleans, right? Um, and OKC has a bunch of players in their team that the rest of the league wants. And same thing with New Orleans. Um, OKC has overperformed or, and, you know, New Orleans has underperformed. Um, do you think both of those teams sort of hold strong and, and play it out? Or do you think someone's going to press the blow it up button? Personally, I, I think they might just kind of have to hold strong because, I mean, New Orleans, they're kind of – I think they would ideally have liked maybe Zion just to miss the whole year and they could just suck and get another high pick and then have those guys, whoever that pick is, if they flip it for somebody or if, um, you know, you just draft uh, another top prospect and, and now gloves are off, we're hitting the ground running, we're going to build the future of the Pelicans – um, but they're kind of in that middle pack. I mean, they're hanging. They're they're on the fringe of the playoffs, um, which is good for them. I mean, they're they're the they have a, a good fan base. Um, same with OKC. I think for OKC, you know, I don't know if you want to blow it up. I mean, what happens to that team if you blow it up and they suck? I mean, they have a rab a rabid fan base. If now the team's just gonna go into that like just cesspool of NBA tanking, like how long would it take for them to dig their way out of that? Um, I don't know if they want to do that. So as long as they can be successful, which they have been, like you said, they're overperforming. Um, I, I think they would want to just, I think both teams are going to, they're just almost forced to stay pat uh, for dollars and cents reasons. What do you think, Christian? Yeah, just my quick thought. I mean, I think both teams are going to stay pat at least till the off season. Um, in terms of like a blow it up plot, uh, project, that's, I feel like either team could go that way in the off season, like a Steven Adams could move or even Brandon Ingram, which I don't know if they want to move on from him uh, in New Orleans, but he's a guy that could they could get assets for since Sion's here. Um, but I think you're you're probably looking at standing pat for both of them, and then the off season, see which way you want to go. So, uh, really quick, Matt, before before we let you go, uh, you know the Super Bowl was the lead story today, and just a couple of quick questions: um, What was your favorite Super Bowl commercial? Um, and then secondly, kind of Super Bowl related, I mean, a lot of talk has been about, you know, Garoppolo, should the Patriots have let him go? Obviously, a lot of opinions uh, changed uh, after last night on that. Um, uh, kind of the Patriots future is kind of tied into how things played out in that Super Bowl last night uh, from a New England perspective. Do you think Tom Brady um, will stay in New England? And do you want him to stay? Because there's obviously a whole lot of uh, cap reasons why maybe the Patriots should just let him go. So your answers to both of those questions he gone he gone it it you you do you have any uh anything to support uh that argument um okay well actually i have a question that i have a a bet going with my dad over a bottle of whiskey of whether or not he's going to stay or go i was saying that he was going to go um 
I don't want him to go. I love Tom Brady, but I think it would be really cool to see him play somewhere else um, and sort of just get to, you know, have that say as a veteran, a legendary veteran, just to have that pull of like, oh, I want to play with this receiver or trade for this receiver. I just want to see him go out with a bang like that. Whereas Belichick's just going to be like, well, you know, that's not what the cap sheet says, so that's not what I'm going to do, right? It seems like for the past six or seven years, people have been like, Brady doesn't have much time left. We need to trade everything for like these good players. And we never do, but we still win Super Bowls, right? Um, as you said, that that could be coming to the end with the situation they have with their with their you know the makeup of their team and their cap space. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I I guess my question was there was a commercial that my dad sent me that you know he was like, oh, I'm not going anywhere, and he's like, see, this means that he's staying. But isn't that sort of like he's not going anywhere? Like he's not retiring? What did you did you guys see that? I saw that commercial, and that that's where we 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 learned the mystery of the Brady Instagram post uh, was was from uh, this commercial. Um, I I think with all his stuff, all the any meetings uh, he takes anywhere he's seen traveling. I mean, he's such a shrewd, I think, businessman. He's playing the marketing game. Um, I think it's going to be impossible to glean. Like he put seven periods at the end uh, of this caption. That's for seven rings. He's staying in New England. Well, maybe it's because he's going to win seven rings, but it's not all with the Patriots. It's his seven rings, not the Patriots' seven rings. Um, I don't think that commercial means anything. Yeah, you could if he stays, people, you can just say, oh, he said, I'm not going anywhere. It's not like he said, I'm not leaving the Patriots or I'm staying in New England. It wasn't a New England-based thing. It was Hulu has live sports. Hulu is everywhere. Tom Brady could be anywhere. I don't read anything into that commercial uh, I think that bottle of whiskey is very much in in jeopardy. Uh, Christian, what's 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 your thought on the matter? Uh, the commercial was uh, about him not retiring and uh, about Hulu. So pretty uh, pretty weak. But uh, I think he's gone too. But uh, that commercial pretty much yeah non factor in either way. Yeah, it, it was like the biggest troll job of 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 the year thus far. Um, as for favorite commercial, probably the one with the the young football player running past the Pat Tillman statue and um, and you know all the other players involved. I think it was sort of like a here's to the next top 100 players. I thought that was really cool. All right, awesome. Well, Matt, uh, thank you for joining the show. Uh, that's Matt Murphy, our uh, resident NBA cap expert and uh, numbers enthusiast. And uh, as he steps away, uh, we're going to transition now uh, into your questions um thank you to everybody who sent in questions um you can send us uh questions throughout the week um you know don't wait you have to wait till we're taping to send us stuff uh you can send us stuff throughout the week uh either through instagram or twitter on facebook um you can find us at 360 sports show you could email the show the 360 sports show at gmail.com um and uh while you're at that you can uh like and subscribe to us on soundcloud on uh, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, uh, pretty much anywhere podcasts are heard, uh, you can find us. So uh, we have a couple of really good questions this week. Uh, we have an in-depth one uh, from Jake um, that I want to get to, and it, it's Super Bowl related, so we're kind of getting back into the Super Bowl talk. Um, he's got four parts, um, and, I'll, and I'll just read this out, and then we'll we'll, we'll, we'll go part by part. Uh, I don't believe Mahomes deserved the MVP. I believe Williams got robbed. However, I believe they should change the format and give the NFL the ability to give the coach the MVP because I believe Andy Reid deserved the award more than any player. That's his first part. What do you think about that, Christian? I definitely, we both agreed Mahomes got robbed. Uh, would you want the coach to become, I mean, because it's not MVP. It's, that'd become uh, most valuable person or most important person MIP um you know at the end of the day it's still a player's game you know the as much as the coach I mean you could give it to Bill Belichick every year I mean that's yeah. <laughs> you know um you know the players are put in a position to succeed Belichick always says it's a player's league though I think you just leave it as is I mean Andy Reid will get his credit for for winning the game uh anyways because of what the players did <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, Andy Reid definitely ain't out there making any plays no, he's he's having a nice double cheeseburger. After uh, I was the gonna game. say he oh, may yeah. be making a couple of moves for some burgers. Yeah, yeah, but I I would agree with you. I don't think yeah I don't think you want to change that. I think you know players driven league, players have to go out there and execute it. 
and you know Mahomes and you know Williams both. Mahomes more so in the in the latter part, but Williams was deserving of it, and I think you want to keep it to a player. Seeing Jimmy G now, do you take him over Brady? All things considered, now that Brady wants years and money, which would hamstring the team's cap, and you still have a forty-two year old quarterback. Uh, I am keeping Brady for however amount. Well, not for however amount of money, because um, we've already talked about this about the Patriots cap situations. But if I had to pick one, Brady or Jimmy G, right now, I'm still taking Tom Brady. I was taking Brady before last night. Now I'm definitely taking Brady. And in terms of like the money aspect, you'd have to pay Jimmy anyway. So that's kind of a, almost a wash. And yeah, Brady's done it. You know, uh, in this day and age, Mahomes can ask for $40 million in a litany of years, uh, but it hamstrings the team. I believe that the only way for Patty Mahomes to threaten Brady's career as the GOAT... Um, good on Jake. I know he's a Giants fan. He admits Tom Brady's a GOAT. I'm, that must have taken a appreciate lot. Appreciate that. Um, uh, you, you've, on you've, behalf of Tom Brady, you've I seen, appreciate You've that. seen the truth, yes. Uh, to surprise Brady as the GOAT is to take a team-friendly contract deal to build around him, and he should go this route. Um, but that begs the question, what matters more in sports now, winning rings and legacy or taking as much money as you can or winning that one ring and then making as much money as you can? Um, I think we see a lot in sports what's happened. Look at Aaron Rodgers. Look, We mentioned Matt Stafford. He's a guy that bent the lines over backwards for a contract and then can't win anything because they're filling the team with low-level talent guys. They're forced to play all their draft picks. And the guys just don't, they can't put any free agents on that team. Um, the the Packers have had similar issues. All these quarterbacks who take top of the market deals, especially when it's guys like Ryan Tannehill reset the market when he was up for a I contract know, yeah. with the Dolphins. Like, what? Just because it's your time doesn't mean you're getting paid like the best quarterback in the league. And that's what's happened. Um, to make a cross sports comparison, Kevin Durant went and chased rings. Uh, in in Golden State, um, I felt like those rings, we talked about the Hall of Fame and all this sort of stuff, when you win championships, it's who you play just as much as like if you've won or not. And I think legacy, you know, that it factors into your legacy. If you're just chasing rings, you better have really earned them. They better mean something. Um, and now Kevin Durant also wants all the money too. Um I think Mahomes is going to want to chase rings. Um, I think he'll take team friendly. It, I think. I think. I just get the vibe that he would take a team friendly, you know, quotes. He's still going to get paid a lot of money. Um, but I do think a lot of these guys, they win. Look at Kyrie Irving. He won his championship and now wants to make a boatload of money. And yeah, I, I think he'd be happy to win another ring, but he's just kind of happy to be out there. He doesn't want to. It's just a game. Doing, it's I don't, you know, doing, doing his thing. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of these guys, um, you know, are putting teams in bad situations. If it were me, I'd want to win as many rings as possible. I would take team friendly deals. I wouldn't care about being the highest paid player uh, at my uh, position. But what is more important now in sports? I think a lot of these guys want to win one, and then they want to capitalize and make tons and tons and tons and tons of money. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of with you. I think uh, Mahomes is going to do both, honestly, because I think. You know, the comparison to Brady is kind of because he's so late in his career. It's like, how much does he want to work with young guys? Whereas Mahomes is, he's 24, right? These guys that'll come in. He has a chance. If he can play 18 more years, he could definitely win more rings. Yeah. And I think just the type of player that he is, he's going to elevate everybody else. So I think he could probably, he he will get paid. There's no doubt about it. And also the NFL salary cap is kind of crap. Uh, in a way, so you'll make it work. And also, I think he'll be more willing than like say, someone like Brady, who's who's done it all, and he'll work with the young guys that come in and new guys every year, and and he'll make it work. Um, lastly, uh, from Jake, can we get effing hype that this is the first year skateboarding is an Olympic sport? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I I'll be honest, I'm not hyped for. I am hyped for the Olympics. I love the Olympics. Um, I'm hyped from this perspective. Um, I'm excited to see new sports. Um, that's why I love the Winter Olympics because you get to see all the, you know, you see the the um, the cross shooting. You see the the 
the the a more obscure you see curling uh you get hockey of course not that that's an obscure sport but anytime i can watch competitive hockey i'm oh, yeah, i'm excited awesome. um you know there's a there's a more diverse range of sports in the summer really all you get to see you get to see the track events um but again it's just people running really fast in circles uh you see the swimming people swimming really fast in circles yeah um and they don't really air much of the field events which can be exciting um you know basketball um but you know if the u.s decides to show up you know the u.s is going to win it's never really you know there's not much drama there um something that's a little bit different and you know i hadn't looked until i saw this question um but i guess you know for these olympics you know they the host and you know they can institute new uh, the, the sports that are in there rotate in and out sometimes. Um, so they added skateboarding. Um, they'll also they'll still have baseball, softball, karate, surfing, and sport climbing as an Olympic event. Which I don't know how how that's gonna work. Like how is that being judged? Like what's the is it whoever climbs up this thing faster? Is it whoever do you get points for taking a certain route? Like is there a time element? If there's a time element and you have people trying to rush up like a rock face, like how dangerous it, that's going to make for interesting television. It's like when you watch NASCAR. I don't watch NASCAR often or any you know motor sport, you know motor racing. But like when you watch some of those and like the element of like these guys are going so insanely fast that like you know yeah. one little misplay and like it's gonna all go down. You know, I was watching. I was in a bar randomly the other day, just as a side note, and I was watching like competitive rock climbing because it was there. And you, you actually saw it on television. Yeah. Oh my. All right. So yeah. please, I want to know, like, what was what's yeah, the, it was what's like? It? Ta- I think it was. So there's a goal. You know, there's a goal peg basically, and they're climbing up the wall, and it's a timed event. So I'm guessing it maybe will be something like that. Um, and all jokes aside, in the skateboarding, it's kind of cool. I'm not gonna lie. Like uh, way back in the day, Tony Hawk. You know, it's it's actually pretty entertaining when you just sit there and watch it. And also the Olympics are great, so I'll I'll sit there and watch it all day. Um. So thank you, Jake. Uh, thanks for sending those in. Um, this one comes from uh, Josh. He says, here's one more of an observatory standpoint than a question, but I will still like to hear your thoughts. Pat Mahomes' first half mentally, first half mentality compared to his second half and specifically fourth quarter mentality, what are your thoughts on it? Does he have that young Tom Brady attitude of getting the job done late in the game? Will he be able to continue this trend going forward? Um, you know, We both kind of kind of touched on that. Um, I thought both teams looked timid in the first half. Um, you know, kind of just throwing jabs, nobody really trying to open it up. Um, when the Chiefs needed it late, um, they put it on his shoulders, um, and he came through. Um, I still think I don't want to. Maybe it's because the Chiefs make it look so easy sometimes on offense. We take it for granted at how hard you know you know. We don't really see what Mahomes did last night. You know, you can't see the forest through the trees. It's like, oh, they, you know, they scored 21 unanswered points to win, but that's just what the Chiefs do. Um, you know, it, it's not like it's not like they had the final drive to go win it, um, where the pressure was all on. Like, if we don't get this drive, we lose. Because even if the Chiefs came up empty on like that last drive, you know, one of their drives, they still could have stopped the Niners, and there was plenty of time left to get yeah. the ball back. Um, so it doesn't quite feel. Um, like a Tom Brady moment um, because you still thought when the Niners got the ball back, like, hey, Jimmy G could go win this right now. And, you know, he was like two yards out of the reach of Emmanuel Sanders of that happening. Um, so it doesn't quite have that Tom Brady feel. Um, I think he's going to have to do it for a lot longer. There's going to have to be more of those moments. Uh, I think we're both in agreement, though, that Mahomes, he could be on that track. I mean, the guy seems he has the right attitude. Yeah. Um, I think when they needed it in the second half, he was able to go get it. Um, if they can keep talent around him and he can stay healthy, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of records will fall. And, you know, depending on, you know, how long Andy Reid stays around and who the next head coach Mahomes has, um, he could catch or surpass Brady. I mean, if he's so young. Yeah, yeah, he's incredibly young still, which is crazy. But you know, you got to have the talent and the coaching and all that stuff. But uh, you know, to be fair, Kansas City wasn't ready to go in the game against the Texans. They weren't ready to go against the game in the Titans, and they came back and won in those. And then same thing yesterday. Both teams are kind of filling each other out in the first half. But man, in the second half, you know, still twenty one hundred unanswered points. It wasn't one of those games where you're like, it was super pretty and flashy, and they're just slinging it all over the field, and here they come. But 
he's got that thing where he's just, you know, he looks at the scoreboard, he says, well, we're down, let's go get it. And last night, again, I, I think he's just one of those guy that, guys that gets it. You know, he has that thing where it's like, we're down, we're not out, let's go score 21 points in seven minutes and win the game. And, you know, he's going to be around for a long time, and, you know, fortunately he's at the most uh, important position in football, so, you know, he'll be there, and he'll probably be in the conversation when all is said and done. All right, thanks for the question, Josh. This one comes from Vinny. Every time my roommate comes into the room while I'm watching football, he asks, how's ladies rugby going? Got any talking points to help me explain to him that football is better than rugby and or soccer? Um, unfortunately, no, because I just think, um, I think rugby is awesome. I wish then you know, American audiences got to watch more rugby or that rugby was more mainstream here. Um, especially, and, and I think if, you know, NFL fans are still NFL fans, but the NFL is not the type of game that it was like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And when people get upset about, oh, just let them play, go watch rugby. It's brutal. Yeah, Those guys hit. And it doesn't happen, you know, as fast as the NFL. Want to know why? That's because those guys aren't wearing pads or helmets. They don't throw themselves around like missiles because they'll actually could kill each other. But you still get some big collisions in that that is a man's sport. Go watch some Nate, Nate Ebner highlights from when he played rugby. Yes, dude was balls. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm not even. I can't come up with any arguments for why the NFL is better. It's just a different game. I mean, you if you you know you can have the forward pass. There's more you know formations. Um, it's it's more of a chess match. Um, with the variables that you have, football versus rugby. Um, but if you're entertained by physicality and just watching like kind of raw athleticism. Um, rugby, rugby's awesome. Uh, I mean, I was so. I mean, the rugby World Cup was was awesome. Yeah, awesome stuff to watch. Um, as far as soccer goes, it's a completely different sport. I mean, I, I I'm not gonna. I, I, I don't even have to make the argument. Um, it, you just have to. It it's a different mentality. I mean, you have to. You can't watch soccer, um, and expect it to be like a football game. Um, soccer is its own thing. It's never gonna go away. It has an issue. It has huge following throughout the entire it's way more popular than american football the mls okay to be fair the mls M- stinks. yeah that's different i'm talking i'm th- when i think like european soccer, football yeah yeah you know the you know premier league and the world cup oh awesome really awesome. Yeah, yeah major league soccer it's not there yet uh in in the united states it has its following it's starting to car- carve out a niche for itself um i think if the revs um didn't pl- if they weren't you know like tenants of Gillette Stadium if they had their own facility and could kind of build um, their own own thing maybe they could get bigger um, I just think you know American audiences it the way our other sports are set up it's just not attractive soccer you know is just not attractive enough I think soccer is a great game I did not think that five or six years ago I wasn't this huge yeah. fan of soccer I wouldn't sit down and watch soccer I couldn't appreciate the smaller moments and how much more happens in a game? I just thought like I was just running around. Like I didn't understand the tactics of the formations, the formations, and uh, the different elements of strategy to the game. Um, you know, I said that net is so big. How can you not score on this giant? Yeah. You know, guys put a you know a four inch puck into a little tiny cage past a goalie who's padded up. You can't put a soccer ball into this like giant net. Um, how come there's not more scoring? Open up the scoring. Let more happen. Um, in my years now of covering soccer at Salva Regina as a play-by-play guy and a, a sports info guy and getting to talk to coaches and see, you know, at a collegiate level guys play and then being introduced to and watching more premier level stuff. Soccer's a great game. It's, ex- an, ex- it's an exciting game. Um, you just kind of have to know what you're getting into. If you're somebody who's not into that type of thing, you have to it takes an appreciation, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah, it's a cultural thing, right? Amer- like MLS, who like who watches the MLS, to be fair? But if you watch like Premier League, European soccer, that, that it's phenomenal, actually. If you just sit down and watch it, you know, um, World Cup, same thing. It's all the, the it's it's just like any anything else, right? The best players in the world play in Europe. Messi, Ronaldo, all those guys. So it's it's definitely more entertaining you know, from a European standpoint or wherever you're from over there than it is here. Because here, 
you know, you have American football and MLS is not popular. So it's just a, it's just a whole different dynamic. One thing like European soccer has that I think some uh, North American sports desperately needs relegation. I love that the bottom three teams get kicked out of the yeah. league and have to go to the next level. Pretty cool. And the top three teams of that lower level get elevated. And there's so many, I mean, it's because there's so many clubs, you know, and so many leagues that there's so many, like you can drop pretty, <laughs> pretty far down. Um, that incentivizes, you know, everybody, every game is so important. Think about how like the major league baseball would benefit from something like that. Cause at least they have a system in place. They have, you know, triple a double a single a um you know there's just way too much money and you know the contracts the way they work in european soccer it's way different than north american sports um but god it would take it would stop some teams from tanking hardcore i think it would create a better product as a whole somehow you could realign the the numbers um in some of these other sports but i think relegation is awesome i mean it would it would it would just add so much more to like you know you might watch some of these terrible teams play at the end of an NBA season and they wouldn't maybe they wouldn't be terrible they'd be trying they wouldn't be trying to like intentionally miss free throws or play the worst lineup or football teams if there was like multi- more football leagues you know the Detroit Lions are not going to have Dan Orlovsky running out of the back of the end zone they're going to be like we need to win this game because we're going to get exiled to the XFL yeah that would be insane actually it'd be interesting to see to, to watch that and see how that would go it definitely take tanking out anyway but um Definitely something they could look at. I don't think they'll do it. But um, last question, um, and uh, this is this is kind of be a fun one. We didn't get to talk about it um, uh, before. We asked Matt uh, about it, and now we'll we'll give our own thoughts. Uh, favorite Super Bowl commercial from from yesterday. I have like my top three. Yeah, um, same. Yeah, and uh, I'm gonna go. We'll we'll go with our our number ones, and we'll work right down. So my number one. Uh, for a cringe factor, from a comedy factor, from just uh, everything, the Jason Momoa commercial, absolutely hysterical for, you know, for, I think it was Rocket Mortgage, uh, coming home and he's just stripping off his biceps and then his abs and then his, his hair. And he just goes from being, you know, uh, sexiest man alive to just this skinny, balding hipstery guy can't lift a, who oh. can't lift a 45 <laughs> pound bar um really awesome for him to do i mean some guys might not want to deprecate themselves you know my body is a temple i will yeah. not make myself look weak um totally embracing uh and doing a commercial like that and i didn't see that coming um and it was it was just so uncomfortable to see that man turned into just like a shell literally a shell of himself yeah, I was not expecting it. Even when the commercial came out, I was not expecting that to happen. I was going to put that in my top three, but I saw you did, so I was like, oh, I'll pick three different ones. Mine, I think, probably will go under the radar, but the Charlie, like if you watch the game through and through, Charlie Kelly and the Tide commercial. Uh, oh, that's went, that's true. They had It was like the law. It was yeah, just like all the, the different Toronto episodes. Out, and I thought it was hilarious. Also, I'm biased because Always Sunny in Philadelphia is an amazing show, and I love Charlie Kelly, but... Um, just the theme of the night every like you know once a quarter you'd see this stain on his shirt it was just <laughs> hilarious the whole drawn out process of it um my second one was the doritos one with sam elliott and it, it wins simply because sam elliott's mustache did the worm and and that it that's it that, that i didn't need to see anything else uh i'm hope i'm waiting for a gif of that to become available of his mustache doing the worm uh, and part of my life will be complete. Yep, that was actually hilarious too. I like that one. Uh, I was going to mention the TB and who uh, Tom Brady and Hulu commercial, but we mentioned that earlier, and I was just going to mention you know the meaning of it. Well, we did that earlier, so that's good. So instead, I'm going to go with the Brian Cranston Mountain Dew commercial, <laughs> uh, which basically was uh, recreation of The Shining. Yeah, recreation of The Shining, which also I thought was hilarious. Uh, lastly. Um, I, I didn't love the commercial, but I love what they're trying what they tried to do. Um, you know, uh the planner's peanut guy died uh, a couple of weeks ago. We all got that uh you know, it went viral. Um the planner's peanut guy is dead. Um and then they were having his funeral in the commercial and he comes to life and he starts speaking like a dolphin and then he's like, Nah, just kidding, you know, I'm back. Yeah. Um but they 
they totally tried to capitalize uh, cuz like there's a woman who yells like is that a baby nut and so baby hashtag #baby nut was trending and all they're trying to do is steal the 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 baby yoda um you know just craze that that's literally all that was i th- i don't i don't know when they decided when, when how far in advance they were making this commercial if that was like something last minute they decided like wait a minute when he comes back let's make him super adorable and cute and somebody's going to say baby nut and and one that's a weird enough statement to make anyways uh sentence to say but it's we're just the, we're going to capitalize on this baby yoda craze I, don't, I i may have been the only one that picked up on that i think i don't know if they even meant to do that when they first started but if so i think that's pretty genius um I don't know your thoughts on the uh, the baby nut. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny, and I think they originally didn't. Wasn't there a story they changed that because of the, the Kobe there was going to be right, more, and like it was going to be like an actually like a sadder commercial. Yeah, a, a couple of different uh, commercials got changed and altered uh, in light of the uh, the accident, um, the, the the Kobe accident. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think you know because originally in that commercial where Mister Peanut died. Um, it was him and like Wesley Snipes and uh, I can't remember who else. They were on a tree branch and, you know, he lets himself he lets himself fall to save them. So, yeah, because the you know the peanut is what's weighing yeah, weighing yeah. everything down. Um, and yeah, I think they they went from having like a somber funeral to something a little more comedic. Um, so that was my that was my my third pick. Um, what was yours? I'm gonna go a tie here. So. The Post Malone and Bud Light commercial where he's trying to decide between Bud Light regular and seltzer and there's like people in his head and he's crashing into the aisles and knocking everything down. But the other one was with, uh, I don't remember what it was for. No, it was, yeah, it was the Sonata, the car uh, with Chris Evans. Um, oh, the the Boston one, John which, Krasinski. They were totally yeah. hoping. I think when they made that, they were like, "The Patriots are dead." That's how often the Patriots just get back to the Super Bowl. Like a year ago, they started making an ad of just about Boston accents. Yeah, banking on the Patriots being the big there. poppies in the window up top in in like this little building. Smart pack. Yeah, smart pack. Yeah, that's what it was. So that and the Post Malone one, I would say tied for three for me. Oh yeah, the Post Malone one was good. There's so many of these where like I I wasn't watching initially. I wasn't glued to the commercials. I generally hate commercials. Um, I thought it was the, good last I, night, I thought the commercial game was very good. Uh, it was very very good. Um, and there was a lot of them where like I wasn't watching initially, and then I hear people go like ooh or ah, bleh, and I look over and the, yeah, the Post Malone one was was really. I was like, what is going on? Oh, they're inside his head, and yeah, then yeah. Uh, at the end he's like, what does he ask for? He's like, you have any uh. You have any chips or something like? He yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Like I forget what it was, but it was like, yeah. One, he asked for some type of chip. We, weird aside, uh, I didn't think of it until last night. Post Malone, like, is he like, uh, like a Bizarro World version of Shia LaBeouf? You know what? Like, you mean the tattoos and everything? Yeah, yeah. You know what he said? I'm, I'm pretty sure I have this right. What? But at one point, Post Malone said he did that because it's just kind of really sad. He said he was like already ugly or something like that so he's just gonna do it anyway or why does it matter or something like that but he he is kind of an odd dude um super talented though but just just from um appearances though like i look like pull up go ahead pull up a picture maybe somebody's already done this the legwork for me post malone shia labeouf i they look just last night it was the first time i noticed it they look eerily similar i don't know if the internet a little bit a little bit yeah a little bit yeah yeah there's Uh, some there's some pictures in here that you would think eh, maybe (laughs) Back when Shia had his beard and all that, yeah. There's some. Uh, there's already some comparisons, yeah. Um, and we'll we'll wrap the show. Um, you know, we we had more we, we wanted to get to. Uh, the Celtics talk uh, took up a big chunk. Uh, we have some 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 small thoughts. I guess maybe we'll give it give it one minute on our other thoughts. Um, uh, the Red Sox still without a manager, and Mookie Betts could be gone any day now. Um, along with maybe David Price. I'm in favor of all of that. Just get a manager. I think. I think bet the under on wins. If you go into spring training camp uh, yeah. without a manager and without your best player, um, what do you think about that, Christian? Yeah, I'm all for uh, bets. Price. Uh, if price. If if trading bets gets price out of here, I'm all for it. And either way, bets is gone. So it is what it is. Uh, they need a manager like sometime this year. So we'll see what they do. But I mean, I'm not quite to baseball yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, the truck, uh, day. truck day was today. Um, 
so that's you know we'll we'll have more of that stuff you know now with the Super Bowl uh, football season officially closing um you know we can spend a lot more time next week delving into the spring training of baseball and uh football off season in full swing there'll be a lot to get to and breaking down the uh the NBA trade deadline um but last thing maybe most importantly what did you think of Shakira and Jennifer Lopez last night pretty good yeah uh actually pretty entertaining i'm not gonna lie it was better than i was expecting uh it was scandalous i know a (laughs) lot of uh a lot of people today were very sensitive to the fact that they were shaking their butts on screen and everybody's watching this why would you do i thought it was good yeah those people didn't have too much problem with adam levine uh yeah right or janet janet well that actually people did have a problem with that but Eh, not as bad as that. Like last night was not that bad. I don't. Think. I thought it was awesome. I mean, I saw a really uh, uh, a funny meme that you know they showed Carol Channing and then Jennifer Lopez side by side. You know, performing the Super Bowl it was like fifty year olds in nineteen sixty versus fifty year olds in twenty twenty. Um, I think you know she's she's part of the Illuminati. She looks fantastic. There's no oh, way yeah. she's fifty years it's old. It's insane. Yeah, I, and it, one of my favorite parts was A Rod dancing in the crowd. That I mean, who who wouldn't love that? Yeah, they also. Oh, that was you. Just remind me. That was actually another good commercial. Uh, it was her like running through a casino, chasing oh, yeah. somebody, yep. somebody in a costume, and it was it was a Rod, but then it wasn't actually a Rod. It was DJ Khaled. DJ Khaled yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the commercial game was strong. I'd love the halftime show. You know, I, there was a lot of backlash about like it being very Spanish heavy and ethnic, and I don't know. I think that that sort of stuff should be representative, kind of like where they were. They're in Miami. Like true, yeah. It's that's a Hispanic community. Um, so to have that stuff, it doesn't it doesn't bother me, you know. That hey, they're speaking Spanish. I don't know what they're saying, but they're singing and there's music and there's J Lo dancing on the stage. Yeah. I'm not. I don't need to know <laughs> what she's saying. No, super entertaining. I thought it was. I, I honestly thought it was one of the better, best ones we've had in a while. To be honest. Yeah, they've. There's been some definite stinkers. There was no uh there was no right shark versus left shark though. That was kind of disappointing. Yeah, not much at least yet. The internet always finds something to meme, but yeah, nothing too memeable out of that halftime performance. Um I'm due uh you still have some homework, Christian. Um you need to watch yeah. the Aaron Hernandez documentary. Yep. Uh and second thing, you need to get me I have mine already. Um top five jerseys. Yeah, you, of know all what, time. you know what I did? I, I would try to make a list of five, and I came up with like 25, so I'm trying to narrow it down. You've got you yeah. to make some hard choices because uh, we're, we're going to make some graphics. Um, we'd love for you guys to get involved in that too. If you want to send us your top five jerseys of all time, uh, we'd love to get some uh, listener contributions to that. And hopefully by next week, we can. I'm going to put out a graphic with our top five jerseys of all time. Um, jersey slash uniforms. And this could, you could go and you could show, you, if you find something that's just absolutely fire, you know, the. Uh, Newell, South Dakota, 1989, boys basketball oh, yeah. jersey. It. If it's something bizarre and it's awesome, we want to see it. Um, so we'll have those out next week. Continue to send in the questions and the comments uh, through Instagram, Twitter, um, and and Facebook at 360 Sports Show. Uh, continue to uh, pump out the show. Uh, you know, we're, our subscribers are going up, the listens are going up, and uh, we can't do it uh, without you. So we really appreciate the support. You can find us um, on iTunes, Spotify. Um, Google Play, tune in, pretty much anywhere you can find a podcast, uh, you can find us. So uh, thank you for listening. We'll be back uh, on Sunday, back to our regular schedule now that uh, the Super Bowl uh, and the football season has come to a close, unfortunately, but still tons and tons and tons to talk about. Talk about. Talk about. There's always one. I, I pretty much got through today without fumbling over words but it's a, it's a weekly thing now you it's have a weekly thing it. now we're gonna have such a great soundboard uh special thanks again to matt murphy for coming by and doing uh uh the celtics and nba cap stuff uh it's a lot of great insights there and we're excited hopefully we can get him back uh after the deadline because uh, hopefully we have some madness uh going on if i'm gonna bet i'm i'm in agreement with matt nothing happens trader danny so with that uh we'll wrap up this episode thanks for listening everybody and uh we'll catch you next week see ya